Thank you, Harold. Oh, let's give him another hand. I just love this man. He's just amazing. So many ways. Oh. Okay, so this morning, our talk title is Love Thy Neighbor. One of those phrases that we hear all the time, right? But what does it really mean? And why is it so important to us? And that's kind of what I'm going to address today. So this month, our topic is Love Out Loud. And in week one, Reverend Alice spoke about the importance of loving yourself. Because when we don't love ourselves, we tend to project our junk onto other people. And she called that othering. I thought that was kind of clever. And in week two, she talked about loving without conditions, uh, meaning to love beyond those social norms. And she invited us to kind of explore where we may have placed conditions on our love. And then this week, our love focus is on my neighbor. So Rick and I and some of our family members, we actually live in the home in which I grew up. And so many of my neighbors I've known my whole life. Um, and I'm very familiar with their ways of being from the nosy to the noisy. And, you know, I love them that way. Um, but I think that would be too easy. That's not what the whole meaning of love thy neighbor is. So in week one, Reverend Alice shared about what Jesus referred to as the greatest commandment in Mark chapter 12, where it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Then it continues on, and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And so these references to thy neighbor are not just the people we know. It includes total strangers. It includes those people we don't understand, those with whom we don't identify, different races, lifestyles, sexual orientations, age groups, and belief systems, be it religious, political, medical, or even dietary. <laughs> and of course, we're not always going to understand everyone, for there are over 8 billion points of view on this planet. And even right here in this center, there are, are as many viewpoints as there are people here. And out of our 8 billion neighbors, some might infuriate us, some might um, perplex us, but we're still being called to love. Just last week at another spiritual center, I had a really interesting experience with this woman. I won't mention her name, but some of you will remember her from our San Juan Capistrano days. Uh, she was a practitioner, and she was filled with so much pain and so much anger that she was stripped of her practitioner license and even removed from some centers in the area. And unfortunately, today, she is still stuck in this victim mentality um, of being an oppressed woman who hates men and spews anger. So obviously, she does not love herself. And um, last week, when she attacked me, I just looked at her and I said, you know, I love you. I go, you're an expression of God. I love you. And she couldn't accept it. But that's okay because, you know, we don't agree on much. Um, in fact, most of things in life we don't agree on, and I, but I can still love her because she is my earthly neighbor. Jesus said, if we cannot love them all, we cannot love God. And since I love God... I choose to love her. I don't have to like the words she says or the actions she takes, but I'm being called to love her. I believe this is how Christianity and Judaism view love thy neighbor. 
And as some of you may know, in addition to being a part of this spiritual community, Rick and I are also part of a Buddhist Sangha, um, a beautiful Buddhist Sangha. And um, we meet online simply because several of our, our members live on the East Coast. They live in New England. And two others live right here in San Clemente. Um, you know, I'm still relatively new to Tibetan Buddhism, and I have gained so much from it. They offer me just another beautiful perspective on everything, everything in life. And so far, I've come to the understanding that Buddhism encourages us to love everything because it is thyself. I've come to know that everything is connected to every other thing, that nothing is independent, and that everything we do affects every part of the universe. And because things are so intricately and infinitely connected, we can never know what the results of any particular action will be. So what we can do is act with love, act with kindness, act with compassion, and not just to our loved ones, but also to thy neighbor, our enemies, animals, and nature. And one of the most rewarding Buddhist spiritual practices is to cultivate the ability to bring love into all aspects of our life, even the mosquitoes, Gosh darn it. As well as to all people we encounter, and not just those that we like. So yes, to the, the one who stole your credit card number. And yes, to that angry driver who was cutting through traffic like a knife. Just a few weeks ago, uh, Rick told me about this experience. He was he was sitting in the car. Um, our son went into the store um, to buy something, and he was waiting. And I'm sure he was on his phone playing words with friends. No clue what's going on around him. And all of a sudden, there's this really loud knock on his window. And so he rolled it down, and he looks, and there's this big, angry man who looks like he's ready for a fight. And he said, you parked too close to my car. It's hard for me to get in. And so Rick just turns to him and said, because I am so sorry, because I had no idea. Can you forgive me? The guy just softened. Rick reached out his hand. The guy shook it. Buddhism has taught us to bring love into our actions when we speak to others, when we are in conflict with others, and when we are living with others in community, which is like loving thy neighbor. And again, it can be daunting, simply uh, facing those who challenge us. But loving begins with just having the intention to do so and appreciating each manifestation of love. The Buddhists believe that practicing loving kindness even just for moments at a time, is beneficial. Each drop of practice is significant. As the Buddha said, with dripping drops of water, the water jug is filled. Now in Hinduism, it's believed that love is the fundamental part of divine nature. And Brahman, which is the source of all existence, is the embodiment of infinite love. And this divine love unites all beings and permeates the universe as a whole. God and creation are one entity. And this means when you love others, you're a loving God. And since you are God, loving others means you're as thyself because you are your neighbor. It is illusion that makes you think that your neighbor is someone other than yourself. So as we continue to, on this golden thread of truth, um, I wanted to mention that Islam 
also stresses the idea of being good to your neighbor and loving your neighbor. The prophet Muhammad said, the angel Gabriel came to me and he kept on telling me to serve my neighbor to the point that I thought he would assign inheritance to him. A man is not a believer who fills his stomach while his neighbor is hungry. In Islam, there are many traditions about being kind and loving neighbors, each of which points to the fact that Islam teaches Muslims to be outstanding citizens, to love thy neighbor, treat them well, and to help them. It's really common to see Muslim organizations out there feeding the hungry. It's another way of loving thy neighbor. In the Quran it says, serve God and join not any partners with him and do good. To parents, kinsfolk, orphans, those in need, neighbors who are near, neighbors who are strangers, the companion by your side, the wayfarer you meet, and whatever your right hands possess. So while I would love to go into even more religious views, um, for time's sake, I'm just going to skip to our philosophy of the science of mind. So on page 503 and 504 of the science of mind textbook, Ernest Holmes says, who is born of love is born of God, for God is love. Without love, nothing can be accomplished. With love, all things are possible. And when we love, our prayers are answered, and the gift of heaven is made. The gift of heaven is life and not death, love and not hate, peace and not confusion. And we enter into this paradise through the gateway of love toward one another and toward God. Love is greater than all else and uncovers a multitude of mistakes. Love overcomes everything and neutralizes all that is unlike itself. Love is God. So we enter, enter into this gateway of love toward one another and toward God. I think this is our, our call to love thy neighbor. And in our Declaration of Principles for our organization, Ernest says, we believe in God, the living spirit almighty, one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause. This one manifests itself in and through all creation. And then he goes on to say, we believe in the individualization of the spirit in us and that all people are individualizations of the one spirit. And it concludes with, we believe in our own soul, our own spirit, our own destiny, for we understand that the life of all is God. Not just some, but all. Again, this all means those people who don't agree with you, don't look like you, don't live like you, don't love like you, don't eat like you, don't vote like you or even those that don't drive like you. This also includes those, those wrongdoers in society. Those we may call murderers or terrorists. And I invite you to just kind of ask yourself, am I able to love them? You know, if we're truly honest with ourselves, I think at times we all struggle with loving thy neighbor. And so we struggle with loving God, especially when such horrible and evil acts are committed by someone. So when I started thinking about how I would present this talk, um, the first thought that came to mind was the state of the, the world, the disturbing state of the world as compared to when I was growing up in the 80s. Um, at that time, my mom always told me, she said, you look at the world through rose-colored glasses. You know, life seemed great. And people were waking up to the errant thinking of, of racism and sexism, and people were comfortably coming out of the closet, and 
Our economy was booming, right? Well, come 1989, um, a gentleman while working at CERN, his, whose name was Tim Berners-Lee, he invented this thing called the World Wide Web. He invented the first web server, the first web browser, and a document for years. We have seen the ability of people to communicate with others around the world become so much easier and so much quicker. And now we have social media right at our fingertips 24-7, 365, so we can constantly communicate with anyone at any time. You'd think it would be a great tool to, com to communicate with people in a loving, a loving community. Yet 30 years later, we are living in one of the most polarized and divisive times in my life. So I thought I would do some research. And um, so I went on the internet <laughs> and uh, looked up how the internet has affected our ability to communicate with one another and love thy neighbor. And so after some extensive research, I, um, in, I looked up in, in the fields of academia and technology and psychology. And um, of course, they both, all of them, agree that there are positive and negatives. But overall, it's, they said it was more of a benefit than a hindrance. So why are we as a society so much more polarized when we have a further reach than ever before? Why are we not seeing more people love thy neighbor? A few weeks ago, Rick and I were blessed to have an amazing dinner party, uh, go to an amazing dinner party with some of our, our wonderful and enlightened friends. And during this time, we had several deep discussions. And one of the discussions was just about this topic, about the internet and social media. And after some conversation, after some contemplation, um, one of our friends said this. If we look at the internet as this infinite consciousness filled with the infinite possibilities, we get to decide where in this infinite web we place our attention, where we are. Duh. <laughs> Isn't this what we teach? This is exactly what we teach. The World Wide Web is not the cause. Our society is not beholden to the internet and social media. As Jill so beautifully said, it comes down to where we choose to spend our time and our focus. The World Wide Web has just given us even more choices of where we spend our time. And unfortunately, so many have chosen places that are the opposite of love. You know, in truth, we know that it never comes down to what's happening out there anyways. It comes down to what's going on in here and where we are consciously choosing to be in this infinite worldwide web of life, internet or not. I'd like to choose where love is the norm. The realization of truth and the embodiment of our interconnectedness with thy neighbor calls us to love all, even the unlovable. But what we must remember that they are God too. So how do we embody this interconnectedness? And of course, it's going to look differently for each one of us here. Um, I'm just going to share some of my suggestions. And if you have any, please come up to me after the service and share yours with me because I'd love to hear them. So of course, number one, prayer. Pray to see all as one with us. And if you'd like to pray for others, pray for your neighbor, just pray for their highest and best good to unfold. Another suggestion, 
Buddhism offers a meditation practice called Tonglen. And Tonglen is when you, you inhale the pain and suffering of others. You give it color, you give it texture, you give it weight, and then you exhale lightness, love, joy. And if you want to learn more about Tonglen, um, Pema Chodron does a great job at describing it and facilitating it. It's also on the World Wide Web. So another suggestion of embodying our interconnectedness with others, those we find challenging, is to separate the act from the person. Suppose John did something that really pissed you off and you're holding that anger in you. And then you find out that it was actually Joe that did it. You're not going to be angry at John because it was the act that made you angry. Separate the person from the act. And I think we're all familiar with the power of forgiveness. Um, In the Matthew West song, one of my favorite Christian artists, he says it so beautifully. It flies in the face of all your pride. It moves away the mad inside. It's always anger's own worst enemy. Even when the jury and the judge say you've got a right to hold a grudge, it's the whisper in your ear saying, set it free, forgiveness. It'll clear the bitterness away. It can even set a prisoner free. There is no end to what its power can do. So let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace. The prisoner that it really frees is you. Forgiveness. So once you're freed by forgiveness, it's so much easier to embody our oneness and to love each other. One of my favorite heroes in the world who's no longer with us on this plane, is Fred Rogers. Hmm. He said, listening is where love begins. Listening to ourselves and then to our neighbors. Listening to ourselves is about going within and uncovering our part of the struggle to love. Then listening to our neighbors is realizing that the pain that we are hearing from them is cause for their actions, as well as a call to love, like the woman last week. When we can truly listen with our hearts, loving thy neighbor becomes so much easier. And the last practice I'd like to share with you is about bringing your awareness to the now. Love in this very moment It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future. Just love now. So living on this vast planet with over 8 billion people, 8 billion personalities, 8 billion points of view, I think it's cause alone to love thy neighbor. You know, Jesus reminds us that if we can't love them all, we cannot love God. So love thy neighbor. The Buddhist teaching tells us that everything is connected to every other thing. Nothing is independent, and that everything we do affects every part of the universe. So love thy neighbor. In Hinduism, when you love God, you are loving others. And since you are God... Loving others means loving yourself. So love thy neighbor. Islam stresses the idea of being good to your neighbor and feeding your hungry neighbor. So love thy neighbor. In the science of mind, love is synonymous with God. And since we also know that we, as as well as our neighbors, are also God, the equation points out to It's all God, so love thy neighbor. I wanted to close with these 
these beautiful words from professor, theologian, and ethicist Reinhold Niebuhr, who is best known for creating the serenity prayer. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. And so it is. Thank you.